We're going to be in Luke chapter 10 today. Um, Many of you have heard this story before. Uh, It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, In fact, this story is so popular that our culture has has taken the term Good Samaritan and labeled it to anybody that is willing to do a good deed for somebody else. And I want us to really think, and and I want us to, to keep in mind all that we've we've experienced today in our worship and all that we've thought about and about who God is, uh, what he has done for us by sending his son, God took on flesh to become like us. That's the most profound thought in the Bible to me. That Jesus would be made in the likeness of men who he made in his image to be perfect and have a perfect relationship with him. But we failed him We sinned, became separated from him, and so he would choose to be made in our awful, ugly likeness so that he could restore that relationship. What a profound thought. I want us to take these thoughts that we've learned over over the last several weeks about Jesus is, and I want us to apply those today. Our theology, our doctrine means nothing if we're not willing to put it into action. It means nothing. It's pointless. Nobody cares what you believe unless you're willing to do something about it. So I want us to look at this passage today with that in mind. We're going to talk about the Good Samaritan. We're going to read Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Read along with me. Um, If you have an app like I do, read along. If you have a Bible like Josh does, he's really old school. Amen, brother? Yep. Or you can just follow along on the screens. That would be fine, too. The Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this smart guy, as often would happen, came to Jesus and he says, Hey, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he's always kind of like, they're always trying to test Jesus, trying to catch him in a trap, trying to get him to say something wrong so he can contradict himself or something like that. And, And he said to him, and Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, you ever wanted to justify yourself? But but I, he said, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered him with a story, and he answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. What an awesome story and a familiar story. I, I've, I've heard this story who knows how many times since I was uh, you know, in preschool, coming up through Sunday school, hearing, hearing all the Bible stories and things like that. And it's easy when we're so familiar with this story to, 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 to gloss over it or, or read quickly through it when we're, when we're doing our personal Bible study or, or just to be like, yeah, I, I, I know that, but, but then we forget to apply it. We forget to, to see how it really fits into our lives right here, right now. So this morning I want to ask you a question. Who is your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? I've had some good neighbors. I've had some bad neighbors. Um... After we first got married, Julie and I, we lived in a condo complex in Pensacola, Florida. And there were several older people who lived there that didn't like us very much. Um, They uh, definitely didn't like our dog. Apparently, so we broke the rules. We got a dog without first getting permission, and it was 
It was a whole big mess. But our neighbor was like out to get us to that after that point. Like the day we were moving out, we had reserved some parking spaces uh, for a pod that was coming in. We were gonna, they were going to drop a pod off. We were going to load everything up, and they were going to come back and pick it up in the same day. And we were literally taking up like two parking spaces. And I don't even know if this woman had a car. So, but I had taken some cones and put out and just reserved these two parking spaces so when the truck driver came, they would be there. Well, this woman, this old spiteful woman, went and took these cones, took them out of the parking lot, around the corner, and threw them in a ditch. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I was so mad. And I had never even met this woman. So we've had some lovely neighbors. We've had some not so good neighbors, but we've also had some good neighbors. Um, we actually haven't met any of our neighbors yet where we live. Um, occasionally we'll, we'll, we'll pass somebody on the street or something like that, but they all seem very pleasant. I don't see any of them throwing our cones in a ditch or anything like that. Um, Grand River, North Carolina, everybody's so nice and kind and, and all that. Um, in Baltimore, we had a decent neighbor. I worked on church staff with him, so I kind of had to get along with him. Um, <clears throat> but recently, there's been a lot of talk about neighbors uh, because of um, the Mr. Rogers movie. Anybody Mr. Rogers fans? I've actually never seen Mr. Rogers. <laughs> if my wife had known that before we got married, she might have married somebody else. Because after she found that out, she was like, you, what? I was like, it's not a big deal. I watched Sports Center and baseball tonight growing up. Not... Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, but most of us live in a neighborhood, um, unless you're one of the lucky ones who gets to live out in the country and not have any neighbors. That's my dream. I would love that. Um, kids, you guys have heard, probably heard me say, don't talk to your neighbor, right? Keep your hands to yourself and don't touch your neighbor. So when we think about the definition of a neighbor... Oftentimes, it's just somebody who's adjacent to us, right? Somebody who either lives beside us or is sitting beside us. And that is true. Literally, it is somebody who is next to us. Or if you are neighboring somebody, if you want to put it in the verb tense, verb form, and uh, you can be neighboring somebody. It means you're beside them. You're adjacent to them. You're next to them. The problem is, though, that we often make our neighbors, we surround ourselves with those either who keep us comfortable, those who we love, maybe just those who love us. Maybe you don't even like them, but they like you, so yeah, hey, come on. Maybe those who agree with you, those who are the same as us. See, that's the problem with neighbors in our lives. We want all of our neighbors to be the people who make us comfortable, who will affirm us, who will love us, who will support us, who will go along with our ideas, who won't give us any kickback, who when we ask their opinion, they won't tell us what we don't want to hear, they'll tell us exactly what we want to hear. And see, that right there is the opposite, the exact opposite of the definition of neighbor that God would give. You see, God wanted to, 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 to meet this lawyer in the passage and completely change his view of what a neighbor is in his life. And Jesus confronted that. So let's take a look at this lawyer. The lawyer in the passage, he would have been an expert in God's law. He would have known exactly what he was talking about. He knew the Old Testament very, very well, and he demonstrated his knowledge by answering Jesus correctly in verse 27. Jesus said, okay, you asked me this question, well, tell me what you think. What do you read in the law? You tell me what the Bible says. And it says, so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So I don't know what the lawyer's thinking right here. Maybe he's saying, oh, well, maybe I already have all the answers as the lawyers and Pharisees and teachers and scribes of the day typically did, they thought they had the answers. And Jesus said, yeah, you're exactly right. Then the lawyer says, well, who's my neighbor? Who are we talking about now? Who is it that, that I really need to demonstrate this to? So Jesus goes for the one person who the lawyer would never want to have anything to do with. 
a Samaritan. He's the one person that the lawyer would want absolutely nothing to do with, would not want him to be around him, would not want to interact with him, would not want to be kind to him, would not want to help him in any way, nor would he expect the Samaritan to do to him. He probably wouldn't even want the Samaritan's help. So the key word in this passage that we say over and over again is neighbor. And as the lawyer tried to catch Jesus in that trap, as many attempted, and I don't know why they kept trying, because they always failed. Um, Jesus turned things around on him with a story. Now this story, a couple commentators think that it could have been a true story, something that actually happened. It also could have been a parable. We don't know, and honestly, that doesn't really matter. It came out of Jesus' mouth, so let's take it as truth, and we'll go from there. But the absolute worst thing that we can do, before we go any further, and this doesn't really have anything to do with the sermon, but the absolute worst thing that we can do with a story like the Good Samaritan, is take it and make everything stand for something. Okay? The, the, the man that's half dead on the side of the road is not you and I as a sinner that's, that, that's half dead in our sins, that's physically alive but spiritually dead. Okay? The, uh, the, 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 the priest and the Levite, they're not, they're not the world that comes by or, or that they're not religion or anything like that. The Samaritan is not Jesus. Okay? Don't over-apply and over-spiritualize every little aspect. But let's take the story and apply the story to what we know uh, in our theology and in our doctrine about who Christ is and what he's done for us. So now let's take that and put it into action. So the history between the Jews and the Samaritans um, was very, very rocky. Jews would have considered Jews to be their neighbors. They were very, very nationalistic. And Samaritans, they, they were possibly from various different origins. I, 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 in studying this, they, there's some commentators who would say one thing, history would say one thing, but it doesn't really matter where they came from, but some possible views would be they were Jews who were not deported by the Assyrians whenever the Assyrians invaded the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, they were, could have been Jews who were intermarried with non-Jews, like those Assyrians who had invaded Um, They could have been descendants of the Assyrians, um, and they could have also been various people, groups, and cultures from other parts of the world, uh, because Samaria was somewhat of of a trade hub in the northern kingdom of Israel. So whatever they were, wherever they descended from, wherever they came from, they weren't pure Jews, and the Jews didn't like that. They worshipped slightly differently. Uh, they, they, they had their own temple. They, 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 it was almost like a, a different country within the nation of Israel. And the Jews didn't like it. They didn't get along. In fact, Jews, if they were traveling somewhere and they had to go through Samaria, they would go around Samaria to get to where they're going, completely around the city to go on their way. Think back to the story when Jesus says, I must go through Samaria. That's when he interacted with the woman at the well and changed her life. And she went and, and proclaimed what, she, uh, what uh, Christ had done in her life in the city. Jesus said, I must go through Samaria because the assumption of the disciples would be we're going to go around Samaria. We don't like the Samaritans. We're going to avoid them. You ever wanted to avoid somebody? You ever went the long way around because you didn't want to, to interact. I did that a lot at college. D could tell you. D did too. D did it more than me. Um, we, I'd see somebody, and um, I would just go the other way. <laughs> Not because I had anything against them. Maybe I just didn't want to talk to them or whatever. But we're like that, right? And to be honest, that's not really, that's not okay. It's not okay to, to just avoid somebody just because we don't want to talk to them. The Jews were dead wrong in their prejudice against the Samaritans. Dead wrong. So let's look at the story. There was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Very, very dangerous road. Lots of bad things happened. People would be robbed, people would be killed, and that's exactly what happened to this man. It was an extremely dangerous road. He was a Jew, and he was attacked and left for dead. Robbed, stripped of his clothing, and left there half dead. We don't know how long it was, but after some time, a priest came along. And this priest 
served God for a living. He was a professional, a pastor, if you will. He should have known exactly the right thing to do. You know he did. He would have known, verse 27, when the lawyer said, well, the law says that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Yeah, the priest would have been an expert in Old Testament law. He would have known exactly what God had said to do. But the priest, I don't know if maybe he'd had a, a long day, maybe a church member had, had yelled at him on the phone or, um, you know, who knows what it was. But instead of showing love and kindness like he would be expected to do, you know, you expect your pastor to be loving and kind. Um, and then sometimes there's Josh. And <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love Josh. Josh has been so great. Um, since we moved down here. This doesn't have anything to do with the sermon either. Um, but I'm so thankful in our whole process for, for our pastor. Um, but anyways, back to the priest. Um, instead of showing that love and kindness, he didn't even walk on the same side of the road. He didn't even acknowledge him. He just passed by, completely ignoring the problem. You ever just ignored the problem and went on? So here's this man in need and the priest, the professional servant of God, an expert in the law, just passes by on the other side. So then along comes a Levite. Now a Levite is a a descendant of the tribe of Levi, okay, The, the priestly tribe of Levi. So the priest most likely would have been a Levite as well. However, this Levite was not considered a priest, but was most likely somebody who would assist the priest with the priestly duties around the temple. He also would have known God's law very, very well. Think of him as a deacon or an elder. He still would have been in full-time ministry, still considered maybe a professional He still knew the law well. He still knew what the lawyer said in verse 27. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And the Levite, he came, the Bible says, and he looked at the man. He saw what was going on. He was willing to take one step further, which I think... I, okay, hey, you at least were willing to, to check on the guy. But no, he looked at him and then left and walked on the other side just the same as the priest did. So then along comes the Samaritan. But before we do that, you know, thinking of the priest and the Levite, we could make excuses for them, right? Maybe they'd had a long day at the, at the, at the temple, <clears throat> Maybe they had to hurry up and go home. Maybe the wife had, the, had dinner ready for them when they got home. Maybe their, their kids needed to go to a ball game. Maybe they had to, to run to the store before they went home because uh, their, their wife needed something to cook dinner. We've all made those excuses, haven't we? Ah, oh, man, the budget's really tight this month. I don't know if I can go buy that guy Big Mac. We've made excuses like that. And the reason why we would make excuses for the priest and the Levite is because we would want to make excuses for ourselves. For the times that we weren't willing to act on God's law. For the times we weren't willing to do something about what God has said and about what we say we believe. But then comes along this Samaritan who would have had little, if any, knowledge of God's law, comparatively speaking. Compared to the priest and Levite, this dude knew nothing. The priest would have had the Pentateuch memorized, the first five books of the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I'm never going to try to memorize Leviticus, or Numbers for that matter. My goodness. Like, I do well to read through it, let alone memorize it. The priest would have had it memorized, word for word, In Hebrew, 
This Samaritan had little, if any, knowledge, comparatively speaking, of God's law. He did not get along with Jews. He knew the history between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, most of the time, the prejudice is focused on the prejudice of the Jews toward the Samaritans. But, I mean, I can only imagine, if there's somebody who doesn't like you, typically, you don't care much for them either, right? Maybe the Samaritan had had contact with Jews in the past who had done him wrong, who had treated him poorly. Maybe he knew that the Jews made a habit of if they had to go through Samaria, Samaria, nope, we're going to go around it. And he knew that they were just a completely avoided people by the Jews. He would have been not just avoided, not just disliked, not just mistreated, but hated by the Jews. This man chose to show love and mercy to one whose people had, traded, had hated him and mistreated him his whole life. And in doing this, he risked his own life. Because oftentimes, people would leave uh, the, these people that they would rob half dead so somebody would come along and stop to check on them, and then they would attack them as well. He risked his own life at this point. Maybe that was why the priest and the Levite didn't, didn't stop. Maybe they thought, well, I don't want to end up like that guy, so I'm going to keep on going. But no, the Samaritan, he risked his life to help this man. He gave his own time. We don't know what he was going to be going to do. It just said after some time, he was traveling along, and on his journey, he stopped and helped him. I don't know about you, but I do not like my travel plans to be interrupted. My wife can tell you. She gets a little upset with me sometimes. Rightfully so, because I get a little stressed out and a little bit like schedule oriented when we travel, because I like to get somewhere and be there, and I like to get there quickly, sometimes faster than law would maybe permit. Um, but you know, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> but he gave up his own time. Time is one of the most valuable resources that we have. And he gave his own time. He spent his own resources. The Bible says there in um, verse number um, 34. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Not cheap things, spending it on this man. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He spent his own money. He gave the innkeeper two days' wages of a laborer. I don't know what this Samaritan did for a living, but two denarii in the Bible <clears throat> would have been two days of labor for somebody who, who either like went and did yard work or maybe they were a carpenter or whatever like that. Two days' wages. And then not only that, after he left, he came back to check on him again. And if there was anything else that was needed, that was, that was spent, he was willing to repay it again. Who knows how much that was? But it didn't matter to him. He was willing to help this man because the man needed help. So how does this apply to us? The Samaritan helped the man, went on his way, repaid everything. Fairy tale ending. Jesus asks the lawyer, you know, which one of these men was justified? He says, the one who helped him. Okay, go and do that likewise. Go and do the same thing. Go and be willing to give, to spend, to risk, to stop, to take your time, to help a man that I know you hate. I'm sorry, to, to, to act as a man would that you hate towards somebody else. That was willing to reach across party lines, if you will. He was willing to go there where nobody else would. <clears throat> the Samaritan demonstrated what Christ's ministry was here on earth. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus redefined what the word neighbor meant for that lawyer. 
And the lawyer was exactly right in verse 27. God does want us to love him with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, our whole strength, but he wants us to love others the way that he loves them. Not the way that we want to love them, not the way that we think they deserve to be loved. Remember, the Samaritan helped a Jew. Think that Samaritan can honestly say, that man deserves my help? He had been hated and mistreated by his people his whole life. But God loves everybody the exact same way. And he doesn't want us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but then love others with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength after we evaluate what they deserve. He wants us to love them the way that he loves them. God loves all people, all people groups, and we should treat others with that love and respect and not prejudice and judgment. We know that from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself. See, see, there's no prejudicial lines, there's no division when it comes to Christ's love. And how dare we choose who we offer it to? God sees the heart of every man equally. A person that was made in his image. Genesis 127 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. He them. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7 it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look on his outward appearance or his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Our understanding of how God views people must change the way we act and the way we think. It must. There's no other option that we have. If we truly believe that God became flesh to die for us, if we truly believe that God put on weak, sinful human flesh in the form of his son Jesus to live and to die for you and for me, that has to change our actions. We don't have another option. We're left without excuse. We can discuss social needs around us and We all know in Durham, North Carolina, there are social needs, are there not? We can discuss our desire to have a multi-ethnic church. And that's right, we we want that. We want to be able to reach all people into our church and have them feel welcome and at home. Because I've been to way too many churches, way too many churches, where even one person would feel uncomfortable. We can discuss our love for our city and our community and wear our uh, uh, Bull City shirts with the little heart on it and the Durham skyline. Zach, phenomenal design, by the way. We can wear those and talk about how much we love our city and our community, but it means nothing if we don't act on it. All of these things, it means nothing. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss social issues. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about these things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about how much we love our community. I'm saying that us talking about it has to turn into action. Why? Not just because it's the right thing to do, although it is, but because of what God has done for us. One of the most amazing lines of scripture that I think there's ever been is as Jesus' hands were being nailed into the cross, 
he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't realize that this is for them. And he was willing in that moment to forgive and, to, and show love to the people who hated him the most. Who were the exact opposite of who he was. The lawyer wanted to make this whole issue somewhat complex and philosophical. But Jesus made it very simple and very practical. He moved it from duty to love. Are we supposed to, to love our community and our city and, and uh, do things to, to better the, the social needs in our city and people and, and things like that? Yeah, you're supposed to. We have a duty to do that. But we will not take action unless we see through the eyes of Christ's love to reach out and to touch these people and to bring them in to our church, to our family and to make a difference in their lives, not because we can, but because Christ can change everything. So I'm going to ask you this morning, in the words of Christ, who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Is it somebody that's out of your comfort zone? Is it somebody that's in a place that you've never been before? Maybe that you've been advised not to go? Is it somebody who doesn't look quite like you? act quite like you, talk quite like you? Is it somebody next door that you've been avoiding? Is it a coworker that sits across the office that just really rubs you the wrong way? Is it somebody that, that has maybe been outspoken and vocal about their dislike of Christianity or disbelief in God? And you've avoided them ever since. I don't know who your neighbor is. Because who my neighbor is is probably different than yours. But we have got to get out of that mindset of our neighbor being somebody either who's just next to us. Or who keeps us comfortable. Or who loves us. Or who approves of us. Or who appeases. Or whatever it is. We have got to get out of our culture's mindset. And see our neighbors through the eyes of Christ. See our city through the eyes of Christ. See our community through the eyes of Christ. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what they need. If we truly believe what the Bible says, and I think we do, we have got to be moved to action. That's what this story is about. The story isn't about some guy who's willing to do something nice for somebody else. The story is about taking what we believe and putting it into action. God gave us his son. He was willing to give up everything. Shame on us if we're not willing to give time, to give resources, to give money, to give his love. Shame on us. Because that's why he came. So that we can lift him up and he can draw all men to himself. Maybe this morning you need <clears throat> to accept Christ's demonstration of love in your own life. Because you can't take the next step and demonstrate it to anybody else unless you first accepted it and how he demonstrated it in your own life. Maybe that's the first step you need to take this morning. But maybe you have taken that step in Christian. Maybe I said something this morning that kind of stepped on your toes. I said some stuff that stepped on my toes. Maybe you've been avoiding. Maybe you've been prejudicial. Maybe you've been judgmental. What will you do this morning, this week, in 2020? What are you going to do to demonstrate the love of Christ to your neighbor? To get out of your comfort zone. To get out of the people, to get away from the people who, who just love you and think you're the most wonderful thing in the world and to reach to somewhere you've never reached before. To go to someone who, who, who might not even like you, who might not even want your help. Jesus died for all, even those who don't want to accept him. 
what are you going to do to demonstrate Christ's love? As a church, what are we going to do to open up these doors and to see all men come to Christ? From all places, from all types, from all tongues, what are we going to do? If we believe what the Bible says, it has to be turned into action. So one last time, who's your neighbor and how will you love them?